Okay, everyone. Uh, hello. Welcome and thank you for joining us uh, again after a two-week break. It's a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Harold Frey from a Space Sciences Laboratory at University of California, Berkeley. Harold received his PhD in physics from the University of Leipzig in Germany. After a few years in the research center of semiconductor company, he joined the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Garching, Germany in 1991. He then joined the SSL at UC Berkeley in 1997. His research interests are the observation and analysis of optical phenomena in the ionosphere and magnetosphere of the Earth. He has been the instrument scientist for the FUV instrument on image and the US project scientist for Ishwal. He is currently a co-investigator for the ground-based observatories of Temis and the instrument scientist of the ICON FUV instrument. Today, he will be talking to us about optical instruments. Uh, before he starts, uh, I would like to remind you that this presentation is recorded as always. So please keep your microphones muted. If you have questions, you can post them in the chat box and we will try to ask them at the end of the presentation. Dr. Frey, thank you for accepting our uh, uh, invitation. Please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction. <clears throat> I will talk about optical instruments and here's my agenda for today. Oh, come on. <clears throat> so I will start to uh, discuss the scientific value of optical observations and the information you can get from those. Then I follow with some basics of optics, the description of optical instrumentation uh, architectures, principles of optical detectors. <clears throat> then I am going to show a couple of examples of instruments for the observation from the ground and space that have been used in the past or are still uh, being used. <clears throat> and I will finish my presentation with a few examples of analyzing Aurora images. Let me start with a few general remarks at the beginning. <clears throat> I will concentrate on optical instruments that operate in the visible wavelength range, so from 400 to 800 nanometers and in the ultraviolet from 50 to 160 nanometers. But I will not talk about observations or instruments that operate in the gamma ray, X-ray or infrared uh, region. <clears throat> I will concentrate my presentation on observations of aurora and airglow. I will not talk about things like the ozone layer or aerosols in the atmosphere. <clears throat> and I have to ask you to please forgive me if I don't show your favorite optical instrument. There are just too many to talk about. <clears throat> so let me begin with the uh, question, what are optical observations actually good for? <clears throat> uh, optical observations detect photons, which are generated by the interaction between either the sunlight or energetic particles with the constituents of the upper atmosphere, uh, <clears throat> hydrogen, helium, nitrogen, and oxygen. The observations can determine where these photons are generated and when the photons are generated. From those observations, you can derive information about the particular process that generated these photons. <clears throat> the optical observations allow you to derive scientific quantities, like the, uh, you determine the location of the aurora, and the dynamics of either individual arcs or the whole roll oval. One uh, very important quantity is the size of the polar cap, which is a measure of the uh, available open flux. <clears throat> Optical observations allow you to time changes in the aurora, like the substorm onset or changes in the reconnection location or uh, strength of reconnection. <clears throat> you can uh, see the response of the aurora to pressure pulses in the solar wind. The observations allow you to estimate the energy and the flux of energetic electrons, which you can then use to estimate the ionospheric conductance. 
you can those we can you can use the observations to determine the composition of the nitro neutral ionosphere especially the ratio of oxygen to nitrogen you can determine the speed and direction of neutral winds you can get information about uh, gravity waves and their properties uh, size or direction of motion <clears throat> you can calculate the electron density in the ionosphere and determine the thermospheric temperature. If you have several optical instruments operating simultaneously, then you can also use uh, tomographic techniques to determine the, the three-dimensional structure, for instance, of the aurora. And let's not forget, last but not least, optical observations give you pretty images which can be used as uh, public relations uh, material, <coughs> which can give you um, press releases or things like that. <clears throat> In the past couple of weeks, we have heard uh, about instruments that measure certain properties at the location where these instruments are measuring. So these in situ measurements give information, for instance, about the strengths of the magnetic field and its modulation or the flux of energetic particles that pass by your instrument. Optical instruments always perform remote sensing observations. So you look at some object in a distance <clears throat> and try to image it as good as possible. <clears throat> if you look at an extended region or source of photons with a two-dimensional uh, imaging instrument, <clears throat> then you always measure the integrated intensity of the light that's coming to your instrument along the line of sight. It is not possible to determine exactly where along the line of sight the photons are generated. <clears throat> and so this extended source appears to you as if every all the photons come from one uh, surface and it is described as the surface brightness of your object. The surface, surface brightness I <coughs> is expressed in units of photons per square centimeter and second and steradian in which they are emitted. In the 1950s, <coughs> the uh, unit of a Rayleigh was introduced in order to describe the apparent emission rate of such objects <coughs> as the number of photons that is emitted into uh, 4 pi star radians. So 4 pi i <coughs> is the apparent emission rate. And if you have uh, 1 million of these uh, photons emitted per square centimeter from your uh, object per second, then this is called uh, as unit one Rayleigh. <clears throat> a good aurora is approximately 10 kilo Rayleigh's bright and the limit for the human eye to recognize something in the dark sky is one kilo Rayleigh. <clears throat> Your optical instrument always tries to count events or photons in some way and the, dis and the uh, response of an instrument is described with this formula. <clears throat> so the accounts per second that your instrument detects depends on uh, the size of the entrance aperture in square centimeter and the solid angle and the radiance that your instrument observes. You can either use this for the whole instrument or just for each individual element or pixel in your image. This unit here, the 4 pi i, is as earlier described the emission rate in Rayleigh's. <coughs> Then the photons that reach the entrance of your instrument have to make it through the instrument to the final detector, which is described as this uh, transmission through the system. <clears throat> Not all incoming photons actually make it to the detector and the transmission of your instrument is also wavelength dependent. Finally, your detector at the end of your instrument detects a certain <clears throat> number of these incoming photons with the quantum efficiency, which is never 100%. <clears throat> and uh, all these quantities together uh, can uh, describe the response of your instrument to an incoming photon flux. I just want to mention that this quantity A times omega is in optical uh, instruments called the étendue or light grasp. In particle detectors, it is uh, called the geometric factor. So this is the same. 
<clears throat> in visible light, you use um, glass lenses in order to focus your light. You use glass prisms to separate the incoming light into different wavelengths, and you use glass filters to uh, suppress certain colors. I don't want to go into much details here because we all learned about this in high school, but the important thing is that you need to understand that in the ultraviolet, almost all materials are opaque for ultraviolet photons and you cannot use this kind of glass systems <clears throat> in the ultraviolet. In the ultraviolet, you have to use specifically shaped mirrors which perform the same uh, function of uh, focusing the light into certain directions and in certain regions. <clears throat> in order to separate the incoming photons at different wavelengths, you use uh, a reflective grating. <clears throat> and the uh, <clears throat> operation of a grating is described by this grating equation, where G is the number of groves per millimeter of your grating. M is the order of diffraction. Most of the time you, uh, you, you work in first order. So M is either plus one or minus one. <clears throat> and alpha is the angle of incidence of your incoming light towards the uh, grading. <clears throat> Thus, the different wavelength lambda are diffracted into different directions with this angle beta. <clears throat> Here's an example what you get if you in illuminate a reflective grating with white light. The light is uh, separated into different wavelengths or colors. Now you have the two options. Either you put a large detector here that will simultaneously collect all these different colors, or <clears throat> you use a single slit to select one particular color and block all the others uh, from reaching your detector. <clears throat> one important uh, property of many um, optical systems is that they have uh, geometric distortions. <clears throat> These are uh, different in for the uh, specific focal length of your optics. So telephoto lenses or systems that have focal length uh, larger than 80 millimeters don't suffer too much from distortions. The human eye equivalent is a 50 millimeter uh, focal length, a wide angle is around 30, and fisheye lenses have focal length of 10 millimeters. And here I show a few examples of just normal uh, photos of uh, objects on the earth. <coughs> demonstrating this kind of distortions that you can get. In this uh, picture here, you see that the uh, corners of the building appear as if they are uh, aligned uh, under a certain angle with respect to each other. But we all know that the architects design these buildings with uh, straight and parallel corners. <clears throat> Another uh, way of uh, distortion is this. Uh, kind of a barrel-like distortion where the straight tower here on the right-hand side appears as if it is bent, which is not the case in uh, true uh, nature. <clears throat> and with uh, very large fisheye observations, you get extreme distortions that in this particular case, the horizon appears curved like this. So if you want to make scientific observations with optical uh, instruments, you always have to determine and know the uh, amount of distortions that your system generates. If you want to determine, for instance, sizes, distances between individual portions of your imaged uh, object. <clears throat> We have heard about the aurora many months ago, so I don't want to go into too much detail, just I want to mention that the aurora uh, is generated by the interaction of energetic electrons with the upper atmosphere, <laughs> and uh, this interaction generates these uh, many emission lines coming from primarily uh, oxygen and nitrogen uh, atoms and molecules. And this is what you want to look at with your observations. <clears throat> One could ask, uh, why do we observe aurora or uh, air glow in the ultraviolet? And there are two 
very good reasons for that. The first one is shown here on the left-hand side. The sun emits a spectrum which can be pretty well described as a black body spectrum with 5,700 Kelvin temperature. You see here that uh, above 4,000 angstroms, the solar spectrum is very bright, while in the ultraviolet and especially the far ultraviolet region around 1,500 angstroms here, it is about five to six orders of magnitude dimmer. So if you want to observe the aurora on the day side of Earth, which is illuminated by the sun and then the sunlight is really scattered and gives you a strong background, then it is basically impossible to observe aurora in the visible wavelength range on the day side, but you can observe it in the far ultraviolet because your signal has to deal with a much, much reduced background. The other uh, reason is the uh, so-called optical depth, with the, which describes the altitude at which incoming light from the sun is attenuated to uh, by a factor of one over e. <clears throat> Here, at about or from beginning at about uh, three thousand two hundred angstroms and up, you see that incoming light can actually reach the ground, and that's the reason why you should use uh, sunscreen at the beach. But in the far ultraviolet range, around 1,500 angstroms, you see that incoming light can only reach down to about 100 or 90 kilometers, and then it, after that, it is completely absorbed and scattered. <clears throat> you can use this information, uh, turn it around in a way that you can also say, all right, if uh, photons are generated somewhere at low altitude, then the atmosphere will not allow these photons to penetrate up into space. And if you have an optical instrument looking from space down to Earth, you will not see any photons that are uh, generated at low altitude uh, in this uh, far ultraviolet uh, wavelength range. <clears throat> that means while in the visible you have to deal with uh, city lights or lightning that can uh, blow up or the uh, scattered light from the full moon that is scattered back into space uh, from snowy surfaces or things like this, in the far ultraviolet you don't have these problems. <clears throat> so your image is in this respect background free. Here's one example of a, a so-called all-sky camera that we use to observe the aurora from the ground. The basic architecture of an all-sky camera is shown here in this cross-section. <clears throat> you have a fisheye lens, which is built in a way that you can really see the whole um, region around you from one horizon to the other then it is very important if you want to filter the light at one particular wavelength, <clears throat> the uh, fisheye lens accepts light from very different angles and interference filters don't work over a extended range of uh, input angles. So you have to make the incoming light parallel, which you do with this uh, telecentric lens, and then you can put a filter at the location here where the incoming light is parallel. <clears throat> We have we built up this uh, Themis All Sky uh, camera system with 20 different cameras all over North America with overlapping fields of view that allows us to generate these mosaics of the whole uh, aurora <clears throat> in this uh, part of the globe. <clears throat> there are two um, basic principles of spectrum spectrometers, which allow you to uh, image the light in different wavelengths. <clears throat> you have to recall an, an object that we are looking at in the aurora or the air glow <clears throat> is a two-dimensional structure in the uh, size. But then there is also, you can consider it as a third dimension, the spectral information that makes your uh, observed object a three-dimensional object, which you can only observe with a two-dimensional detector system. <clears throat> 
So in order to do this, you have to throw away one of these three dimensions. And here are the two main systems that uh, are used to do this. In the top here, you see a uh, principle of an imaging spectrometer. <clears throat> For simplicity, all these optical elements here are shown as uh, transmission elements because it is uh, much easier to understand in the ultraviolet. As I mentioned earlier, you have to do this with reflecting, uh, reflective elements. <clears throat> so the in the imaging spectrometer, the incoming light is focused by some optics towards the uh, entrance slit. Then behind it, you have uh, optics that makes parallel light out of this, which is <clears throat> illuminating the grating and the grating separates the incoming light in different wavelengths in this particular example here in the horizontal direction. <clears throat> so what you what what this system does it basically uh, collapses the horizontal spatial information and it maintains the in this uh, presentation the vertical spatial information and it maintains the spectral information which you can observe with your detector. The spectrographic imager on the other hand has an input slit <clears throat> which is imaged by some optics towards the grating and this optics generates an image of the outside world at the location of the grating. The grating <clears throat> separates the wavelength of the incoming light, which is then um, put through some imaging optics through uh, exit slits <clears throat> and that then uh, are observed with your detector system here at the end. <clears throat> what you do in this um, arrangement is that in some way you throw away the spectral dimension, but you keep the two dimensional information which is uh, just <clears throat> specific for one particular wavelength. <clears throat> so in this kind of uh, instrument, you can either put one exit slit or two, or if you have enough space, you can also put three uh, slits there and observe the outside world in spectrally filtered true two-dimensional images. <clears throat> the um, principle of an uh, imaging spectrometer was used on timed GUVI and is today used on ICON EUV. And the principle of the spectrographic imager was used on the image spectrographic imager and is now used by uh, ICON FUV. <clears throat> Now let me come to detector systems. The simplest detector for photons is the photometer or photomultiplier, where you have a so-called photocathode. This is some material that uses the photoelectric effect to transform an incoming photon into a photoelectron. This photoelectron can then be accelerated by an applied potential into this uh, body of your uh, photomultiplier tube, where you have these many dynodes <coughs> which respond to the input of a uh, electron with a multiplication of the electrons. And if you have many of those dynodes uh, past each other, you can achieve multiplication uh, factors of the order of uh, 1 million or 10 million, which is then sufficient to actually <coughs> detect uh, current pulse at the output, which allows you to detect these individual incoming photons. <clears throat> But uh, I have to say the uh, photometer integrates over the whole area that uh, your optical system is uh, looking at. <clears throat> the combination of a multi-channel plate and some other uh, reading detector, in our case, which I will discuss here, the cross delay line detector, allows you to actually make real two-dimensional images. The channels in the multi-channel plate are each basically individual photomultipliers. <laughs> you have a photocathode at the front, which generates a photoelectron, and then the applied uh, potential inside each of these little uh, pores <clears throat> multiplies the electrons. And at the output, you have an electron cloud, which hits your detector at a certain location. And the 
working principle of the cross delay line detector is that you have this kind of an electric wire when an electron cloud hits this electric wire you measure the time that the uh, pulse <coughs> um, reach, re, uh, is, is read at the two ends of your electric wire and if you uh, determine the time very exactly then you can determine where the uh, electron cloud hit your uh, grid of electric wires and uh, normal <clears throat> systems you have uh, two uh, of these uh, wire grids uh, perpendicular to each other and the four amplifiers at the output measure the uh, charge pulse <clears throat> which allows you then to determine the x and y position of each individual photon where it hit your uh, detector system and this way you can uh, build up your final two-dimensional image <clears throat> Uh, more um, <clears throat> a different uh, detector system is the uh, charge coupled uh, device which <clears throat> responds to an incoming photon by the creation of an electron hole pair if the energy of the incoming a photon is large enough to generate this electron hole pair in the semiconductor material of your uh, CCD. <clears throat> and the CCD is um, divided into uh, many different individual uh, photon elements here, <clears throat> which um, hold the charge of the electrons that were generated in these individual uh, <clears throat> imaging elements here for quite some time and the readout happens in two different ways here I will uh, discuss a little bit more in detail the so-called frame transfer where your uh, semiconductor has this imaging section which actually really sees the outside world the photons hit this uh, part of your semiconductor and generates the charge in these individual elements and at the end of your integration period, you shift the whole image down into the so-called store section, which is <clears throat> uh, covered by a foil or by uh, some layer of metal so that no light can actually reach it. <clears throat> and then you individually read out these um, lines of <clears throat> charges over time, which then builds up your uh, final image. Just as to give you uh, an example, in the ICON FUV instrument, we have this uh, charge uh, frame transfer uh, CCD architecture. We take integrations for 120 milliseconds. The shift of the charge down into the store region is pretty fast. Uh, it takes 2.3 milliseconds, but then the readout is again uh, rather slow. In our particular case, 100, almost 117 milliseconds. <clears throat> and that's why with this kind of instrument, uh, you cannot uh, take shorter integrations than this uh, roughly 100 milliseconds, 120 milliseconds. The other architecture is the interline transfer, which has uh, per, uh, next to each individual imaging line, a storage line, which then requires uh, many output uh, <clears throat> uh, reads. And this way you can read them out much faster. <clears throat> More modern uh, detector systems are these uh, <clears throat> complementary metal oxide uh, semiconductor devices, which are nowadays used in most modern systems and, for instance, in your uh, smartphone. The advantage of these systems is that each photodiode has its own uh, readout register, which allows you to read out these uh, systems much faster and which also require much less energy, <clears throat> which is a big uh, advantage in things like your uh, smartphone <clears throat> that you don't uh, drain your uh, battery too fast by taking pictures. <clears throat> Many of the satellites that fly in space are uh, 
three axis stabilized. And if you put a camera on one of those satellites, you can point it down to earth and you can observe the aurora very nicely. But then <clears throat> in many cases, you have also other instruments on the same spacecraft, for instance, electric field antennas or uh, particle detectors, which rather want to have a spinning spacecraft in order to really observe the three-dimensional structure of the electric field or the flux of energetic protons. But a spinning spacecraft is a little bit of a problem for uh, imagers <clears throat> because you only see the object, for instance, the roll oval for a very short period of time. And I try to um, demonstrate here the uh, so-called uh, time delay integration technique, which was originally developed for imaging fast moving objects. But if you have an instrument on a spinning spacecraft, then uh, the same is that you observe a more or less quasi stationary object from a moving uh, platform. <laughs> so if you have a uh, as an object that I just show here as an example and take a very short snapshot of it. You don't get many photons and your image is not really bright. <clears throat> Taking images all the time leads to this smearing and you cannot really distinguish and uh, determine the structure of the scene. The time delay integration technique is shown here uh, on, on the right, <clears throat> where while the camera is looking at the object and with the moving uh, or spinning spacecraft, the, it sees different parts of, the, uh, of your object. <clears throat> you can then put these, you take very short snapshots and you put all these individual snapshots with the proper a horizontal offset into your memory where you add them up. And in the end, your time delay integration technique can give you a very good and clear picture of your uh, scene, even from a spinning platform. <clears throat> As with all scientific instruments, you have to do a careful calibration on the ground, which will only then allow you to make useful scientific measurements in space. <clears throat> Optical instruments have three main properties that have to be calibrated on the ground. It's the imaging capability, the imaging quality, and the quantitative sensitivity of your instrument. <clears throat> in the uh, ultraviolet, because uh, ultraviolet photons don't travel well through air as I showed earlier. You have to do this kind of calibration in a big vacuum chamber. And furthermore, some of these imaging properties are temperature dependent <clears throat> so that you need to do your ground calibration, not only at room temperature, but also over a certain range of temperatures, which you expect to uh, experience in space. And uh, this kind of <clears throat> calibration is then done in a thermal vacuum chamber. One big advantage of optical systems is that it is pretty easy to do in orbit calibrations in space. Over the past decades, um, astronomical missions have observed all kinds of uh, stars and have uh, determined and measured very accurately their spectra. When you then <clears throat> point your optical instrument at these stars, you can determine what the expected counts of the incoming flux from these individual stars should be. Compare it to the real counts that your uh, instrument determines. <clears throat> and this way you can make a very nice uh, in orbit calibration of the sensitivity of your instrument, which you can also then use to monitor the performance of your instrument over time if you repeat these calibrations uh, regularly. <clears throat> Here are a few examples of optical observations with the uh, image 
uh, FEV instrument, we got a full view of the rural oval seen here, together with the uh, very bright uh, day glow, sun illuminated portion of the earth. <clears throat> Down here, I show as an example, the size that an all sky camera can actually observe on, from the ground this uh, little circle here, <clears throat> which uh, for an all sky camera can give you this kind of a view. I have to mention these two uh, images were not taken simultaneously. So this this is not this, the, the same scene. From low earth orbit, you also have the option to look sideways towards the aurora so that you can in some way determine the altitude structure of your uh, aurora as it appears. <clears throat> Then uh, with a smaller angle uh, optical systems, you can make better views, in this case from the ground of the oral oval or uh, individual oral arcs. <clears throat> and if you have uh, systems with a small field of view and very fast readout, you can then observe these kind of structures of curls in the aurora as they move around <clears throat> um, and uh, <clears throat> can observe those and make these nice movies. I need to mention that uh, what you see here is not actually motion in the uh, ionosphere. Nothing in the ionosphere is moving at those speeds and uh, at those directions. <clears throat> it is the aurora is generated by the incoming beams of electrons and these, these beams are distorted. It is as if you uh, <clears throat> stand in a dark room, have a flashlight and point it uh, at the wall and move it around, then the spot of the flashlight will change, but the wall itself does not move. This is the equivalent of the aurora that you see here. <clears throat> Now I want to come to a few examples of instruments that have been uh, used in the past. <clears throat> the first one is uh, the Guvi or Suzy that uh, was flying on uh, <clears throat> timed. <clears throat> this is the principle, as I mentioned earlier, of the uh, spectrographic imager. <clears throat> it has a scan mirror which allows to look from one horizon to the other horizon and while the spacecraft is moving it is building up this kind of a swath image of the roll oval <clears throat> it has a, a very good spectral resolution and you can monitor several wavelengths simultaneously. <clears throat> but you have to keep in mind that the buildup of such an image here takes of the order of 20 minutes for the spacecraft to move from this side to that side. So if you see some structure in the aurora, let's say here in the morning side, and roughly speaking 20 minutes later, you see some other structure here at the evening side, it is not guaranteed that the two structures occurred and existed at the same time. <clears throat> The uh, polar UVI <coughs> instrument is shown here. It uh, was capable of observing in very different wavelength ranges, <coughs> but only at uh, one particular wavelength at a time. It used a complex system of reflective and transmissive filters with a total of 35 reflective layers <coughs> to then build up this kind of an image of the roll oval, which here shows a very nice transpolar arc. <coughs> I also want to mention that uh, UVI was uh, 15 kilograms. <clears throat> and the next example here of our spectrographic image on the image spacecraft was 20.9 kilograms. So in general, all these ultraviolet systems, which require quite a large optical system <clears throat> are heavy and are not uh, useful on, for instance, a CubeSat you, for this kind of system, you need a real bigger spacecraft. So with the uh, <clears throat> image SI, we could uh, take these images of the electron and pro uh, of the proton and the electron aurora simultaneously. <clears throat> Here's a, a image of this instrument without the cover <clears throat> and the spectrographic imager in uh, ray trace is shown here. The uh, light is coming in from the left. You have a, a collimating mirror which uh, collimates the 
light to the grating shown here. The grating separates different wavelengths into different directions where you have the exit slits. And then you have uh, two detectors uh, monitoring uh, two different wavelengths. <clears throat> the ICON spectrographic imager uses basically the same general technique. <clears throat> it is shown here to give you an uh, impression of the size of that instrument uh, with uh, respect to uh, the size of a human. <clears throat> the uh, ICON FUV uses um, in, uh, intensified uh, microchannel plate and CCD seal tube. It is even heavier with uh, 33 kilograms and it is used to determine the ratio of oxygen to nitrogen on the day side and the oxygen ion density distribution on the night side. The ICON EUV instrument is an imaging spectrograph as explained earlier, <clears throat> which allows you to monitor the uh, altitude distribution of your uh, emission. <clears throat> but uh, it integrates in the horizontal direction on the detector. Then you get these individual uh, lines of the different wavelength <clears throat> and the uh, ICON EUV instrument is focused at two particular oxygen ion lines at 61 and 83 nanometers, which are shown here, <clears throat> which you can then uh, use to determine the uh, day site uh, oxygen ion altitude density profile. <clears throat> I want to mention one other instrument, the uh, overall imaging camera on the Japanese Raimi spacecraft. This spacecraft was in low altitude orbit. <clears throat> they had three independent cameras with filters looking at three different wavelengths, which then allowed them to <clears throat> take these simultaneous images of the aurora in these three different wavelengths and compare the output <clears throat> uh, with the uh, <clears throat> particle measurements that the particle detector on the spacecraft uh, uh, measured at the same time. <clears throat> And one more instrument that I want to mention is Israel, the imager for sprites and upper atmospheric lightning. This was the first dedicated instrument to observe sprites from space. Sprites are related to lightning. <clears throat> they um, are very short and very brief um, <clears throat> objects that only last for a few milliseconds. And the big question is, how do you observe these uh, short-lived structures from space <clears throat> uh, and make useful measurements? So uh, the Israel instrument had two main components. One was an intensified CCD camera that operated in the visible wavelength range and had a uh, filter wheel so that different filters could be put into the ray path. <clears throat> In addition, it had a spectrophotometer of six individual photometers operating from the near infrared uh, from 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 the uh, near ultraviolet to the near infrared in different wavelength ranges, <clears throat> the system was running so, um, continuously and writing the output data into a circular memory buffer. When the photometers detected a very sudden increase of brightness, it was interpreted as a trigger, and the system was commanded in a way to take data for a preset further period in time, then stop uh, uh, collecting new data <clears throat> and the readout of the collected data from the circular buffer uh, took much longer than it was, uh, than it took to write into this buffer. So in this example here, <clears throat> the system triggered on this sudden increase in brightness in all these photometer channels, which was related to the sprite appearing here on top of the cloud. <clears throat> we, uh, with the circular buffer, we were able to keep one image or we could also have uh, kept two images before the image with the trigger signal. <clears throat> then we take uh, more images, in this uh, case here, four more, 
that allowed us then to also observe uh, this uh, later sprite, which developed at a different location, if you look very carefully. The instrument was also used to observe uh, air glow and aurora. And here is a movie of aurora observations where we were able to catch the onset of a substorm while our spacecraft was flying over the aurora oval. <clears throat> The uh, incoming uh, energetic electrons <clears throat> can only reach a certain altitude down into the uh, ionosphere. The <clears throat> um, probability of generating certain photon emissions, certain wavelength depends on the altitude. And in the uh, visible wavelength range, this method of comparing different colors to each other was developed uh, in the 1980s, <clears throat> so that from the uh, different colors, you could make an estimate of the most likely energy of the incoming electrons. The same can also be done in the ultraviolet, but there <clears throat> you look at the uh, output of the atmosphere at uh, two different wavelength regions, which uh, suffer from a different level of uh, attenuation and uh, absorption by atmospheric uh, oxygen molecules, <clears throat> where then you can compare these uh, in polar UVI. It was, for instance, the LBH long and short wavelength regions, which gave you a very nice uh, dependence of the incoming energy over the ratio of these two emissions. <clears throat> In the uh, in 1994, we had uh, five different cameras set up around the uh, ASCAD radar in uh, Scandinavia when we uh, observed uh, an auroral arc crossing over the common volume of all these different cameras, which are all pointed to the common volume of the ASCOT uh, radar beam. And we were able to reconstruct the three-dimensional structure of the emission in this auroral arc. At the moment that the arc then actually crossed the radar beam, we could compare our three-dimensional reconstruction with the measurement of the <clears throat> electron density done by the radar. Optical observations can be used to determine the onset of a substorm, like in this particular example from our Themis system. <clears throat> this camera was the first one that determined the sudden increase of auroral brightness in, uh, related to the substorm onset. And then we could follow the expansion of the aurora towards the uh, west and east <clears throat> as the uh, substorm expanded. <clears throat> One other way uh, and thing that you can do with optical observations is you can determine the speed of individual structures. A nice way of doing this is that you take uh, difference images, uh, we, you subtract the previous one from your image, <clears throat> which gives you this kind of uh, difference image um, display, <clears throat> which you can then use to determine the speed of individual rays as they are moving along your aural arc from uh, east to west. In this particular example, the speed of uh, rays that we observed in this arc was uh, 4.5 kilometers per second. <clears throat> um, this was all what I wanted to present today. I have listed here a couple of uh, references for further reading if you are interested to learn more about the aurora or uh, instruments and the way they are operating to observe aurora or air glow. And if you have any questions, you can either ask them now or contact me at this email address. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Harold. That was fantastic. Very detailed and clear presentation. We do have a number of questions, but uh, while I'm giving everybody a chance to type their questions, I'm going to remind everyone that we do have a talk next week. Uh, Karan Lenquist will be discussing electric field instruments. And yeah, we're going to go to the questions now. The first question is from Eric Lund. And the question is, do any of the FUV lines you mentioned have an issue with delay versus prompt emissions? 
as some visible wavelength wavelength lines do, such as uh, 557.7 and especially 630 nm. So the uh, lines that we use and select in our systems are particularly uh, selected that they don't suffer from uh, this kind of uh, lifetime issue. <clears throat> the uh, LBH band is more or less a very uh, immediate um, emission. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Ankush Baska. Um, and he wants to know what is round out rate for CMOS sensors compared to CCD. If uh, COMS is fast, why can we use an instead of CCM, CCD, sorry. Um. So you, you have to you have to uh, distinguish between the integration time and the readout time. <clears throat> so with any of these systems, you can integrate for a time period, whatever you choose. <clears throat> it is just that the uh, readout of the CMOS detector is much faster because each individual photodiode has its own readout register <clears throat> so that you... Um, let me say, don't waste time waiting for the readout to happen. Okay, thank you. So the next question comes from Jason Shoster. Um, in addition to spirits, is the Ishwell instrument also able to resolve other types of up atmosphere lightning phenomena, e.g. Alves, blue jets, etc. So the uh, Israel instrument operated for, uh, I think, 11 years, and we collected thousands of sprites, elves, blue jets, gigantic jets, uh, pixies, all kinds of these lightning-related uh, transient luminous events were recorded by that instrument because it was running at this very fast rate, which allowed us to... Uh, <clears throat> program it in different ways so that we were very sensitive to particular things. Um, elves, for instance, are um, very bright in the ultraviolet, while sprites occur at lower altitudes and they are primarily bright in visible wavelength. So yes, <clears throat> we, we detected thousands of those. Uh -huh. Yep. And uh, also he wants to know for different maps of images, is there any difficulty distinguishing a spatial variation versus temporal variation of the rural structures, e.g. when determining their speeds? <clears throat> so in general, these images allow you to follow <clears throat> the temporal changes pretty well because um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so uh, if, if you calculate these uh, difference images, <clears throat> you uh, look at the speed of the difference that is moving, let's say from east to west, <clears throat> but uh, you can also looking at uh, the individual location in your images, <clears throat> you can determine how the brightness changes with time. <clears throat> so in the very end, you have more or less a mix of spatial and temporal things because you don't really know. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but uh, as I tried to explain earlier with this um, example of the flashlight uh, moving at uh, across the wall, <clears throat> The, the incoming beam, the, the, the current of the incoming beam can stay the same, but it can be distorted in a way that it hits the upper atmosphere at a different location at a later time. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I'm sure you can't see the chat box, but there are praises for the presentation. It was really great. Um, and we still have some more questions. Well, specifically, if I have to name Jason Dare and Patricia has been uh, 
praising your presentation. Uh, so we go to another question. Actually, let's go for a question from Patricia. Uh, could you please show the image of the Tamis reconnection image again? Um, I would like to show it to my class tonight and it may take a while for them to post the recording. Well, okay. although we try to post it as soon as we can. You mean this one? Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Perfect. Hold right. on one second. Take, take your screenshot. <laughs> yes, yes. <clears throat> uh, we Perfect. will try to post it as soon as we can, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Harold. Um, yeah, another question coming up very late is from uh, Elise. Uh, what is the minimal scale of aurora which is possible to observe from the ground? So there have been observations in the past which determined uh, scales down to 100 meters. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Um, going back to a question from Ankush, he wants to know what future advances in imaging will be considered as big jump in the optical observations, such as quantum devices? I think the bigger problem is uh, to get optical instruments into space in the first place, because it is currently, to my knowledge, the only really planned instrument is the uh, SMILE mission, <clears throat> for, which is a collaboration between uh, China, uh, Great Britain and Canada <clears throat> that will observe uh, the aurora from very high altitude. <clears throat> In terms of, um, let's say, uh, <clears throat> technical improvements and developments, there are a couple of things like uh, <clears throat> you certainly want to have a large field of view to see the whole roll oval. But then on the other hand, you also would like to have a smaller uh, field of view to determine individual structures within the roll oval, which is then a compromise that you have to find at some point. <clears throat> uh, Further developments are uh, possible with the improvement of mirror coating. Currently, uh, mirrors in the ultraviolet reflect of the order of 90% of the incoming uh, photons. <clears throat> you certainly want to improve this reflectivity by uh, improving the way how the coating is done and the uh, material that you use for the coating of mirrors, there are certainly uh, possibilities given in the future to improve that. Great, thank you. Uh, well, once again, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you for accepting our invitation to talk. Uh, it was a great presentation, wonderful, very detailed. Um, I would like to remind everybody again that we do have a talk next week, although it might not be updated on the website. Um, and also we will try to put this presentation online on our website as soon as we can. So thank you everyone for joining and thank you so much for the great presentation, Harold. Thank you, have a nice sure. day. Thank you for your attendance, thanks.